I was researching you and your life is, is one of the most eventful out of anyone I've ever researched. And there's been some crazy moments, um, violence. Were you exposed to violence in, in your childhood? Always. That's all it was. Like violence was my normality. And I've explained to a lot of people. When you're like literally battered, battered like with a belt, till you bleed because you got cheeky or because you ate too much of something like it, it, it just it was just there was times like I didn't even know why I got beaten like because an example my my dad used to keep all of his cannabis and things like that in a shed outside the house right and I used to get bad for arguing and beaten and all sorts one day yeah my brother like, and I don't hate my brother for this. It's not an issue. Like, I mean, my brother ain't got an issue. It's my dad, right? And my brother blew the shed up, like, on fire. Blew it up, right? And when my dad come home, I was, for once, because I weren't getting a beating, I was kind of happy my brother was going to get a beating. <laughs> so, I mean, I was like, oh, you're in it. You're going to get it. Dad's going to burn you, boy. Ah, 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 ah. I was giving him all that, like, take the piss out of him, yeah? So then... Before my dad's car, because my dad had a 35, a Rover 3500S sports one, bright, black, white with a black roof. So he used to have his music blaring, so you could hear it coming, boom, 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 and then you hear the brrrr of the engine. Do you know what I mean? You think, oh, dad's home, then you hear it all go off. So it's like, you're getting it, you're getting it, you're getting it. And my dad's coming, fuming, and he's coming, gone to it with my brother, my brother dropped on the floor, and then my dad said to him, what do you think I should do to you? My brother went, beat me, beat me. My dad went, get to your room. And I was like, what? What do you mean get to your room? If that was me, I would have got bad. Then I got to beat him for being cheeky. And I could never understand that until I got older. Then I got older, I realized that my dad wasn't the biological father of my brothers and sisters. Mm. So I mean, it was just me and my little sister. So it was confusing to say the least growing up getting battered by the person that you love because there's something your brother's done or your sister's done. I, I could, so when I went onto the street, it was a thing where if anyone tried to emasculate me or any of my friends, it weren't happening. So I used that anger towards my dad to take it out on other kids. During those moments that your dad was beating you, did you have any idea what was going on? Sometimes, sometimes, but I couldn't understand if my sister's done something. What am I getting a beating for? Because I got cheeky. My brother blew up, blew up. I don't know, that, that, in them days, yeah, cannabis was £5,000 a kilo. £5,000 or £3,000 a pound back then. Do you understand? Like, it was expensive. My brother, yeah, has blown up a shed full of, Boxes of this shit. Like, and he ain't got bad. Come on. I was nicking carrier bags of it, yeah? And giving giving it away to the olders for 50 pound. So I know they were getting a lot more for it. And my brother never got bad. So I was I could never understand that at that age. It's only now I've realized that my dad wasn't his son. I realized why my dad wouldn't beat him. And obviously I've got under his skin at the wrong time. And he gave me a slap. Because he was confused himself. What was your relationship like with your mum? Sweet as a nut. My mum was my best mate, my confidant, my go-to. I believed everything that came out of my mum's mouth. And unfortunately, it prevented me having a relationship with my dad. Like my mum done well. My mum done the best she could. My mum supported us and protected us. My mum done what she felt was necessary to get us where we got to. And if it wasn't mm. for my mum, I wouldn't be this man I am today. I wouldn't be where I am. And God knows what I would become. I mean, so... I'm glad I was mm. the man I was to get through what I've got through to be sitting here today, to be able to help millions of others overcome issues, traumas, and situations that they may feel impossible. That's the, the thing is, nothing's impossible. Everything's possible. You just got to be in the right mind, in the right place with the right people. Because what I look at now is everything to do with criminality is mental health, all of it. There's so much ADHD and other conditions in the in the prisons, and a lot of people don't even know they have it. No. 
Undiagnosed. I'd, I'd have known to hide it into all the psychologists to tell me. How many you got? You got how many kids? Well, I had got? five, but oh. we got four. My 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 youngest son died on the twenty sixth of May. This year. Yeah. I'm so sorry. I didn't know that. Yeah. Do you mind asking? What he happened? had epilepsy. He de he developed epilepsy late in life. I think his body just wasn't long enough to withstand the fits as he got older, and he just got found on his bedroom floor by his nan. Every time I mention his name, the sun comes out. So the sun's just come out outside, I know that. And when I come over it, it come out as I mentioned his name. Mm. And this, I'm just living daily in his memory because he was a really lovely kid. He was just the nicest kid ever imagined. He was just, he was a nice kid. He was a nice kid. That's what he was. He was just a nice kid. Never had a bad bone in his body. Never had a bad bone in his body. He was just a nice kid. And he just lived his life. Yeah, okay, mate. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And <laughs> he'll be able to be back there again, just laughing up. What's the matter with you? Come on, you know me, liven up. So <laughs> we had the a relationship that was, I believe, insurmountable, where my other son's nose got put out of joint for some reason, I don't know. Well, obviously, he thought someone was trying to take his his footsteps or his position, but it wasn't. It was just, Kane was different. Yeah, Kane was different, man. Kane was different. Kane was different. And we bonded in a different way than me and my son bonded because Kane wasn't my biological son. He was someone that I basically adopted from four years of age until he was 26. So even with that feeling, I dread to feel one of your own biological kids going because it is hard work. It's hard work. But I do have a knowing belief that he's up there because every time I mention his name, the sun comes out. Everything I'm doing, everything the sun comes out. Mm. Whether it's raining or not, within five minutes of me talking about things, the sun comes out of the cloud and just come. Over. It's mad. I mean, we were sitting in the pub the other day, me, Barry Andy, um, Titsy Davis, and a couple of others. Murat and John. We were sitting there, we were all talking, and it was pissing down with rain, it was wind blowing. And I started talking, and all of a sudden it was like a beam of sunshine just come through the, the everything. And it happens too much. So I know he's there and I know he's watching. I know we've got another guardian angel because my brother and my cousin were the first two that went up mm. and they prevented me getting killed when I got shot point blank range in the eye. Because that was another one. Nah. There's no explanation for that. Like, you know about that? I know about your eye, right? yeah. yeah. Have you seen how close it is? Come closer. Now, inside there, you can see the back of my eye. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I can see yeah. I've got the back of my eye. It stopped halfway through my eye, just stopped flat as a pancake. They know how it stopped. No, they said it was a miracle of God. The yeah. police was sitting around me with it. When I woke up, yeah, mm. when I woke up, I had maybe 12 police officers all in their assault gear because instantly I just thought they're trying to take me out of there. And then it was like, no, no, mm. tranquilo, 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 mm. tranquilo. Uh, uh, and I was like, what? They was going, it was the hand of God. The hand of God is what saved you. Like, we're praying, we're praying. Like, this is miracable, miracable. And it was like, this is amazing. And then they actually brought me the bullets, the flat pancake bullet. It was about that big, do you know what I mean? And they go, wow, it's incredible. Like, and I know they're not allowed to do that. And they did. They brought me, they showed me the bullets and it's a, it's a miracle. How? And then basically after three days, I got rid of the police and then had all my boys around me. And then we went back to work. It was mad. But I never noticed until, I didn't realize how bad or severe it, it was until I see the x-rays I'm going to show you lot. When did you start getting into crime yourself? Really? 11 years of age. When it was really crime. That's when I went here. What did that look like at 11 years old? I don't know, a couple of hundred pounds a day. Within a few months, it was up to a couple of grand a week. 
you used to steal a couple of hundred quid a day. Yeah. Did you More than that, we used to nick thousands of pounds a day. Like, it, it doesn't sound believable, so it sometimes it doesn't make sense. So look at it like this. We used to get 140 pound for one car stereo. Yeah? I lived in, at the time, I lived in Abbey Road. So I used to walk from Abbey Road through St. John's Wood, down Swiss Cottage, through England's Lane, down Belsize Park, through Hampstead, down into Kentish Town, Queen's Crescent. Right, that was Mercedes galore, right? So we used to nick the stereos. But what we used to do, we used to go see the stereos. Say we had 25 stereos in a line. Then we'd go and get a cab, yeah? First we'd smash all the windows, then nick the stereos, bake the stereos up, then get a cab to go and pick it all up. And that, that was how we made mm. money. And then the money, we couldn't get paid in cash. So we ended up getting drugs for cash and then started giving other people drugs. I was giving people puff when I was a kid because I used to nick off my dad. And how that come about was I went to the carnival. And we all chipped in a five week to get a bag of weed. I'm expecting a big bag of weed. I used to sell a bag of weed 50 pounds to the older lot. So that's when I started cutting it all up and selling it in schools. Mm. So I started laying all the kids on in all the schools around Northwest London, Quinton Keniston, Atlam Burley, William Ellis, Hanfordstock, Collins. I used to give it to people I knew there to sell. And then we used to make money. Did your parents ever tell you off for the criminal activity? My dad activity? was doing it. My dad was doing it. My mum was, my mum was everything she could be. She worked, 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 but she's a kleptomaniac. My mum's a kleptomaniac. What's a kleptomaniac? A shoplifter. Right, okay. Uh, she has to nick things. My mum's just a kleptomaniac. She's, she is, I'm sorry to say, but she is. And uh, she's a kleptomaniac. So we learned that art very young. You didn't? Did you inherit that kleptomania? Yeah, I ne not inherit it, but I nicked everything. <laughs> I nicked everything. I, I, I stole everything. I mm. never, I never paid, and I can honestly say for this, I never paid for anything really until I was forty-two. Literally, I stole everything I had until I was forty-two. Every bit of money I had to pay for everything was stolen. I never worked. The only time I did work is when I got out of prison on a license and then worked my license out so I didn't go back to prison on my license. And that was it. Crime my whole life until I was 42. We all have different things that trigger us and ignite this rage. What, what triggers you? Ignorance, stupidity, all that sort of thing. It's mad, that. Confrontation. If you confront me, then it's the worst thing to do. Not now so much now, but back then, you want to confront me. Now, you make yourself look silly. I mean, it's a, I'm not that guy because I won't allow myself to go back to prison for someone else's stupidity. I know what I'm capable of doing. So I'll just laugh to myself. And I'll say, look, you really going to do something, punch me in the face, or stab me or cut me, or piss off. And that's what I'll do now. And I've had a couple of arguments where I've actually gone up to people in their face and said, mate, you're going to have to punch me in the face, you little mm. mug. And they punched me in my face. Go on, you're hard. Punch me in my face, you little mug. You little tramp. I've had, cause I've got a, a habit. When I speak to people in a vicious way, I spit at them when I'm speaking. So I do things and, and so they're all spitting in the face. I used to use it as a tool when I was growing up to emasculate people. So I found that who would and who wouldn't say nothing to me when I spat in their face? And only nine, only 2% said, what are you doing, mate? You spit in my face. The rest of them just suffered it and kept wiping their face. I mean, so I used to do it on mm. purpose just to see who was people to be careful of. You think you're quite sensitive to rejection? Your loss, not mine. Always has been. It ain't a rejection thing with me. I don't, I don't what? I, I add value. I add value. Anywhere I go, everything I've ever done, I add value. And even you'll see when this goes up, it adds value, mate. Everything I do adds value. And then ripple effects of what we are doing, what we are building, depending on how creative and courageous you are, will determine where you go. How about that? Because <laughs> we're going to the top. We're building empires, mate. Yeah? Every empire was based on a, well, built from a crime. Remember that? Every empire. And my empire started with me. And now it's starting from my humble beginnings in a porter cabin in Hammond Street, mm. Kentish Town, HMP headquarters. Boom! <laughs>
go back in time a bit. When, when did it escalate? It continued to escalate because every step of the journey, I was introduced to the next level. And in my opinion, like I made some good friends and I did, and you know who you are, you're my best friend, but everyone else are mugs, mate. You're working for people, risking your liberty, getting stabbed, shot and killed for someone else, someone else's product, someone else's work. Why? For what? Do you know what I mean? For what? Do you get it? So I'm now creating platforms and frameworks to create millionaires and billionaires and empires. And I'm going to use my frameworks of network, influence, and uh, education, and mindset, spirituality, wellness. We're creating communities, man. Next level, HMP communities. Well, a lot of the messaging that you're, you're giving out now is such an amazing contrast to the, the, the Marvin that people will know. Is there a particular moment or thing that happened that made you turn your life around? And what made me turn my life around was some people I opened doors for. So basically, if some people needed help doing something, I'd give them something so they could earn themselves some money. So there was a couple of people that I helped out right, um, through friends of mine that said they were good kids. So I said, yeah, put him on then, give him this, give him that. Anyway, one of these kids run a bill up for 200,000 pound, right? So when I got out of jail, I thought, well, how can he run a bill up? If it costs this much and he can, like one product was 1,000 pound, he could get 3,400. The other product was 15,000, he could get up to 30,000. So I thought, how are you owe me 200,000 pound? So I, uh, I actually thought, I've got to shoot this little <laughs> and he's got to go. And I found out he's my son's best friend. Or the guy two. you were going to shoot, you found out was your son's best friend. Yeah. And that so, was the moment. Yeah. And then I just said to him, look, I can't do this no more. He was like the ripple effect. Because I thought about killing him. And I thought about the effects of what his family would do to my son and my kids. Mm. And I thought about, I'll shoot him and the, the, what his friends would retaliate. Because they was in the game at a decent level because I was feeding them. I knew their powers. And I didn't really want my son and nephews to get dragged into a world of my bullshit. So I just said to him, look, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. You can either come off the road with me today and we do no more shit, right? Or I'll, sell you, or I'll give your debt to the people or sell it. It's up to you. And they won't be so nice. The, no, they if you sold his debt. You. They'll do it. Mm. You know what I mean? And he said, I'll come off the road. So he come off the road with me that day, young guy, big up the faith and positivity and the, the belief that would make it son. Do you know what I mean? And he has a strong belief in my powers, man. Like we've got the powers to change. And as long as you can change, you've got the powers to do anything. Do you know what I mean? And that's all we've done. And now he's running his own church. How old were you when this, when that moment happened? Maybe 40 or, hmm. it was when I found out who that kid was, it was about a year later or six months later. I can't remember the actual chronological order. I got out, got my life back on track, got my shit back in order, sorted my life out, got my house, my bits, my bobs, do you know what I mean? Got settled, do you know what I mean? Because my whole life got blown. You remember, I was living in Spain with kids, yeah? And I had other kids here. So I had a family in Spain and a family in England. So I had to make sure my family in Spain got back to England, got to a house, got to, like, everything's got to get sorted out. My girlfriend was very efficient mm. and getting the job done. So she got all the kids back to England and settled in the house. Everything was good there. So I had to make sure everybody had money every month, money to live, money. So I, when I got out, I had to make sure everybody still had their money, you know what I mean? And that's what I had to do. I'm fascinated to, to hear a bit more about the life before that moment. And was there a particular moment where you, where you look back and think, I'm lucky to be alive? All of it. All of it. All of it. There's been times what stabbed in my heart. What stabbed in my heart, Rob. And the only thing that saved me is I've turned like that and it cut me open. I mean, but it went into the, where the, the heart bag is, another centimetre would have pen, penetrated the heart and I would have been dead. Man. What, oh, what, what led up to that moment? An ecstasy tablet. Started from an ecstasy tablet. A couple of kids bought an ecstasy off my mate. They didn't like the buzz, so they wanted their money back. So it just escalated into tit for tat violence. And then I see the kid in the chip shop. Um, Blue Sea Fish Bar. Queen's Crescent, yeah. <laughs> best chips in the world, mate. I'm telling you, best chips in the world. The only chips you won't have no grease on your paper. Facts. So, yeah, I've seen the kid in there getting something. So I've run in there and tried to stab him up. But I weren't stabbing him. I was stabbing his coat. And then he's pulled out a big sword. And then we've run outside. Because he's run outside. I've chased him. He's pulled out a big sword. 
And then I've, he'd gone giving it all out, so I've just run into him. So I weren't scared, man. He just sort of went in as I felt it go in, is when I've turned and then gone to cut him and then he's run. And then we, he, we chased him. He ran into his girlfriend's house and I booted the door open, run in the girlfriend's house after him. He ran up the stairs, up another flight of stairs and then run to a window and dived out the window. So I weren't diving out the window. I'd run down the stairs and give chase. He got away and then I caught him on another date and I caught him, put a blade in his throat on the floor because he was the fastest runner in the manor. And I, I run, run him and I kicked his back leg and he fell over and I got on top of him. I put a blade in his throat and I just said, I want to ask you once, mate. Once and once only. Do you want to have this now or not? And he said, no. I said, well, you need to get up and leave this manor. Otherwise, I'm going to kill you. And that was it. And he left the manor that day. And that's a fact. Yeah, he did leave the manor that day. And he went off to do other things and he became very successful. Yeah. When that knife went into your heart cavity, is that the closest you've ever been to death? No, I don't think so. I had a car crash, um, a bike crash, 100 mile an hour bike crash in Queen's Crescent pulling the wheelie and giving it the big one and the van's pulled out, I've hit it head on and just, and everyone said I looked dead, but I was wanted, yeah, so because I was wanted, I had to get away, it was mad, I, I got taken to the hospital, my legs swelled up, massive, you know what I mean, and uh, I, I just got out of there that night and just went home, got in bed with loads of morphine mm. tablets and just took morphine tablets for a month. And then one of my friends got shot dead and there was an all points bulletin. So I had to get up and then we ran out on a rampage and then I got arrested for 19 murders. You got shot in the face. How did that happen? That was over in Spain. That was at the end. But that was, that was the penultimate act that kicked me into a harsh reality of my existence, I'd imagine. It was after I got shot, I started seeing who people were and what I meant to people and that the love wasn't real. The love's not real on the road. Remember that. Yeah, the love's not, it's not love. You wouldn't love somebody. You wouldn't give somebody a product that would get them stabbed, shot, or killed, or put in prison. You wouldn't do anything that would get anybody stabbed, shot, or killed, and put in prison if you loved them. And that's a fact. You know what I mean, so I realized I was never loved. I was always used, and I was a benefit to all the grooming, exploiting older generations of the vegan mindset me personally, I would never encourage any youngster to commit crime. Now I know the systems of business. Look at you. Look at your pals. Do you know what I mean? You lot know the business structures. Look at you. Never have to commit crime. You know that. You know that. Oh, you, our elders are telling us, nah, workings for mugs. Is it bollocks? When you look back at your time when you were active as a criminal, do you, do you have any regrets? No. Not at all. Because I overcome obstacles. And this was, I replaced trauma with trauma. This is what I've realized. I was that insane, yeah, that I just went from trauma to trauma to trauma. If you stab one of my mates, you had to get shot. If you shot one of my mates, you had to die. That is just rules. And I had integrity that wouldn't bend, break, or but quiver. So I was investigated for over 24 murders. I never actually committed any physical murders myself. I never grabbed anyone around the throat and killed them, and I never shot anybody in the head and killed them. Do you know what I'm saying? That never happened on my watch. Right? I've said, say you had a problem with me, yeah? Then I'd say to someone, this is what's going to happen to him. Lo and behold, it happened. So I got the blame for it all. And that's a fact. Do you understand? So I'm a selfless person doing selfless acts now, but I was a selfless villain doing selfless acts in that world. Because I've done nothing but protect people in that world. I never had no problems. Never had no problems with no one. No one. I fought everybody else's battles. And that's why I can walk about my head all night. Because all the people that we had conflict with know that I wasn't the contributing factor to the ag. I played a part and I'd done a job. Or not I, we. Because it was a few of us. Do you know what I mean? And that was it. And I wasn't on my own. Never has, never will be, and never want to be. Unfortunately for me, I did put my poor group before my kids as a kid. And that's one thing I regret, putting crime before my kids. How's your mental health today? Turbulent. Very turbulent. See, because I'm an honest person, yeah? I just think about things honestly and 
It's turbulent, mate. Turbulent, but it's it's getting better, and we're we're finding calm waters. So it's becoming a lot easier to deal with. Because life is just something we've all got to deal with. And you've got to navigate yourself through all your turbulence, all your obstacles, all your hurdles. Because you are responsible for what you decide to do. Think what you want, mate. But do what you do respectfully, humbly, and selflessly. And you'll be good, man. There's a really fun section, Marvin, in the podcast. We're, we're, it's a new section. Come on. It's called The Washing Machine okay, of Woes. Tell me what it is. And I reach out to my ADHD community and they tell me their problems, their woes. Right. And I put them in the washing machine because people with ADHD quite often forget to take their washing out of the machine. Right. You relate to that? No, all my washing's out, mate. <laughs> See? <laughs> Gone. <laughs> well, hopefully we'll see if you relate to the woe. Right. See, right, again, so... you're too intelligent for me to get this. Do you know what I mean? Like, I don't understand that. It's mad, isn't it? I really Brains out... work in different ways. Gone. All right, so this week's woe is oversharing and not having boundaries when discussing certain things is a huge problem that I have, and I had no idea it was part of my ADHD. You think you overshare? Yeah. I'll give everyone everything. Has that always been a problem? It ain't a problem until they don't fucking share. Do you know what I mean? When they don't share, then... I think you horrible... Yeah, okay, we'll see. And that'll be it. I'll just cut them, mate. It's weird. It's, I, I like, I just think everybody should have everything. And I think that's how it should be. And then when I'm like that with other people, and it's why I couldn't be a criminal. I mean, that's why I've got to do this thing now, because if you were skint and we were criminals, I'd go and rob a security van yeah, to come and give you the five or ten grand that you needed because you were my pal. Even if I didn't need to go and do it, I mean, I'd say, oh, I'll well, I'll get you some money, man. Come, you drive, though. Because it was that easy. Do you know what I mean? I'd do it. I'd do it. Do you know what I mean? And I've done it loads of times. I went and got parcels of drugs off people that I didn't even take. I'd give it to you. I've always given everybody everything. But I, I, my wrath was always my downfall. So people used... People used my wrath against me when they done bad things. Oh, you know what Marv's like? You know what Marv's like? They're what Marv's like. But they don't tell you what they've done. Hmm. When, you, when they don't reciprocate. Yeah. Yeah. I only give to small people, small selected few people. And there's other people that I'll give dispensable to. There's people I go out. I used to go out and pay thousands of pounds. People are partying and drinking and I pay their bills when they're in the nightclub, certain nightclubs or certain bars or certain restaurants. I mean, I'd pay their bills. There's certain people that are drunk in certain clubs that never had to pay for nothing because I paid their bills. Yeah, I paid their bills. And then every now and then you might ring them up and say, oh, can you do me a favor? I say, oh, I can't. Yeah? Yeah, you can't, yeah? All right, sweet. And then I'll find a way to get them in the gym. Mm. Get them in the gym. And I say, yeah, I'll put the gloves on. I go, what? I say, come on, we'll have a little mess about it. I don't know, I'm fucking about it. And if, they're like, if they actually don't want to get in the gym, then they get told there and then, get in the gym or I'm going to use a tool. It's up to you. Gloves in the ring or a tool out of the ring. Your choice. We've been like that for. We've been like that for. Get in the ring so we can sort our issue. But I've got an issue. In the ring, silly bollocks. And that's how I've done everything. And everybody, everybody knows me knows they've been punched up in the ring. And if it ain't in the ring, it's outside their front door. That's how I worked. If I had a problem with you, I'm coming to your ass, mate. About women and kids, I'm coming to your ass. Once I beat a man up in front of his kids, and I've never done it again after that because I felt bad. And it only dawned on me when I left because I thought, wow, that's what my dad used to do to us. And they don't know me, they must have been double frightened. And it hurt them worse than my dad. Do you know what I mean? So I was that, I couldn't do that again. So that never happened again. Do you think? The, what your dad did to you when you were younger, do you think that's a trauma? Yeah, because I wouldn't allow no one to be emasculated. So I went through, I faced death rather than back down. That's trauma. How's that not trauma, you know? I mean, I was prepared to die for you every day of the week. And when people never reciprocate that with materialism or money, or I think you're horrible. Because I'm prepared to die for you. 
Like when they pull out them guns, when they pull out, I was there for you. And I, would, and, I, and I actually went into this. I've been scarred for other people. And I got shot through, shot through business because it was a business move that got me shot. Not by my own people as well, supposedly. Wrapped in that world. You've been to number 10 Downing Street, Prime Minister's house. How did that, how did that feel? You know what? That was one of the best days of my life. I literally, like, to think I'd never be, I didn't think I would, when I got told, like, me mate rang me up, said, I'd get your glad rags on, you're going Downing Street. I was like, piss off, you prick. I said, there's nobody going to have me in Downing Street. I've only been off the road a couple of years. Are you mad? Do you know what I've been nicked for? Do you know what I've been up to? He was like, Marv, I'm telling you, you're in. I was like, I piss off. I said, you need to speak to whoever you're speaking to and do your checks first. He said, they're done. Three o'clock, I need to meet you. I was like, piss off. He said, yeah. So I met him and we walked into Down Street, not even no checks. I was in the queue. I was in the queue, standing behind Big Nasty. Big up, Big Nasty. I'm standing behind Big Nasty. We were having a chat about bits and bobs because we know each other. Um, and uh, all of a sudden, I've heard, Mr. Herbert, Mr. Herbert. And I've turned around and there's a major standing there with all the police around him. And I was like, yes. He said, what are you doing? And I'm standing in the queue waiting to come in. He said, no, you don't come, please, please. We, we must be, we must be now. Walk round, walk round. I was like, okay. So then I've walked around, walked in, walked in. And then he took me up and put me in front of six very influential people within the government infrastructure. They all give me their cards said, right, we're here for you. They've heard my story, obviously. And after they heard my story, they said, there's my cards. And we'll support anything you want to do. I was like, sick. And now we're just about to launch. If your parents could see you going into 10 Downing Street, do you think they'd be proud? Yeah, my mum is. My dad, my dad was always proud of me, though. Because my dad just tried to... Uh, what I've come to realise in my former years is my dad just tried to be badness out of me and my dad was a bad guy and he was a violent guy however my mum was a contributing factor i mean like my mum was a, a drug addict as well i mean and a, a bit of a drinker like my mum wasn't an angel she done the best with what she had she was a she was abandoned and neglected as a child herself she had her own trauma i mean she got brought up by not just her parents, like she was very conflictuous. No one accepted her within her family when she went out with my dad. There was very racist in Liverpool at the time. So she had overcome her own issues. So she was the fighting child, um, followed closely by my auntie Marion. And they just done the best they could. And they thought they could handle life on their terms. And they just realized, now hopefully now, they've realized that it wasn't a bad journey. It was a good journey. and. They've done well, man. They've done well getting us through. I mean, because all of us are well. Apart from like, my son that's died. Apart from that, we ain't had no deaths in the family of the youngsters. Do you know what I mean? Uh, my brother died when we were younger. My cousin died. One in a car crash and one of a heart attack. And that was when I was 20 years of age. Sons, things like that. Which is the first, I think. I don't know anyone that's lost a son yet. But it empowers me to do better. Do you know what I mean? Like, it really does. Like, it empowers me to do better. Now, the one thing that losing my son has done is give me the ability to be nicer to everybody. I mean, like, I'm just got to be nice. And that's why I wish everybody to have an amazing day when I see them on the street. Have an amazing day. Don't let yourself down. Ma told you that. Have an amazing day. And it just makes people smile, so I do it everywhere. So that's my cane. Do you know what I mean? I think a lot of people are probably proud of you, Marvin, for the work you're doing now. Yeah, do you know what? I don't do anything for anyone else. Do you know what I mean, like, I don't do it for that. I've never been that guy. I just, my only aim and goal is to make sure you achieve your goal, if that makes sense. But prior to turning my life around, I made sure you made you achieve your goal by any means necessary. And I was this, the, the driving force in front of you to achieve your goal. And that was it. I just took everything out of your path so you could achieve your goal. But then I'd get really upset if you let me down and never wanted to achieve your goal. And then that's when people got beaten and shot then as well. It was mad. 
What scares you? Nothing. Yeah, nothing. Everyone's scared of something. So what I used to be scared of, the really, really black sea. You know when the sea goes really black? I'm scared of that. I'm scared of big fish coming <laughs> and grab me. Yeah, you know I mean? that's, yeah. What, that's it. That's what I'm scared of. Then what's underneath? Yeah, that. And do you know what? The universe. The universe frightens me. So I work in conjunction. I always have done as a kid as well. Always work with the universe. Always worked on that spiritual element of life. And I've always been it. All, all my mates know. I say, I say, I ain't doing it about the feeling. I ain't doing it about this. I ain't doing it about that. This happened. I'm not doing it. I've only seen one magpie. I'm not doing it. I mean, like, I was very tuned into certain things that I wouldn't bend, break, or change. And they've got me here today. So I'm just tuning, finally tuning the rough edges and polishing the diamond, so to speak. What's the future hold for Marvin? The country. I wouldn't be surprised if me or my children become to be MPs or some sort of government infrastructure of benefit to people. I mean, I, I know we're going up to a level. I'm already in with the government. I've just, well, we, we, not me, I got invited from friends and associates to the first ever boxing event held in the Old Bailey between Moss Side Fire Club, Fire Station, and Fitzroy Lodge. And surprisingly enough, the Sheriff of the City of London competed. Imagine that in an exhibition fight in the Old Bailey a month ago. So we're doing things to change the narrative on crime doesn't pay health, fitness, and reducing crime and violence, man. That's what my game's aims and Goals are, so that's where we're heading. Full steam ahead. Boop, boop. <laughs> you know I mean? Where can people find you if they want to reach All out to you? All my social medias, Mr. Marvin Herbert, and Marvin, yeah, Mr. Marvin Herbert on all my social medias. And I respond to everybody. I mean, um, every now and then I put my phone number on that. And I'm, I'm getting loads of nuts driving me mad, little kids, but. I've got to be there. I've got to take it. So I do give me number out. So it's 07, 07471973159 because I work better on communicating on that level. I, I can't stand emails or messages. Like I don't look at my phones for messages and things like that. I just don't do it. Mm. Don't do it. But yeah, I like communicating verbally and physically and then things get done. It's just the way my brain is. Part of my autism or ADHD. So I've got both of them and it's combined. So everything I go through, I understand now. I, now I know why I used to get so angry when people couldn't do it my way. I mean, now I get so angry when people do things a certain way. Like I know why that. I mean, so I can address it. I just... <sighs> You're like a lot more regulated. I sort of understand your brain a lot better. Yeah. Through, and I've got to give him his props, Professor Steve Peters, The Chimp Paradox. I'm telling you, without that book, I wouldn't be here today. I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be here. I would never have believed I was insane. I would never have believed it. So I understand the concept of The Chimp Paradox. I'm telling you, it's, it opened my eyes. Now I'm in, you're going to see where I'm going. So stay tuned. Marvin, there's a question we're asking all the guests at the end to finish with. And that's, what's the most impulsive thing you've ever done? Everything in my life was impulsive. Um, the most impulsive thing I'd done, which got me arrested with um, two firearms, was there was an incident where someone got stabbed up and beaten up. That was our age group. And then that escalated onto the kids' uncles firming up and turning up at my house and taking my girlfriend hostage, right? And basically, when they took a hostage to drive around looking for me, I went home. I'm aware, unbeknown to me, unbeknown to me, what they were doing. So I'm indoors, my buzzer goes, Marv, 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 they've got your Lisa, they've got your Lisa. What are you on about? Who? Them lot, them lot, them lot. I was like, wow, what are you on about? And with that, I've seen three or four cars pull up with all these um, 
big lumps getting out of the cars and giving it a big one. So I've run out the back of the ass, got the firearms, run down the stairs, come out the front of the ass, put the guns like that. Said, mate, you make one more step outside my ass, I'm gonna have to blow your fucking head off. Said, Do not move, otherwise I'll blow your head off. That wants to be real. I said, take one more step and I'll blow your head off. We're kids, you lot of big men, because I was only a kid and they're all big men coming up there. And then he went, and then the most impulsive thing from that was leaving the scene because when I left the scene that night, it was alleged that I tried to shoot a bouncer, pistol whip someone, shot at someone because I went on the rampage looking for them lot. So anyone I saw that evening thought I had a problem. And it was just everywhere I was going, getting out of the car. Oi, you, boom, 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 boom. Get back in the car. I'm looking for them lot. Oh, there's another car. Oi, you. Because I was just gone. I was just mad. I was angry. That was the most impulsive. And that was, nine, I think, 1989. 1988, 1989, that was. I got Nick for trying to shoot the bounce with Camden Palace. Well, thank you for sharing that, Marvin. And thank you for your time today. Yeah. It's been fascinating. Thank you, you know, so much. My pleasure. <laughs> to do this, pulls up, I aim to do that, and grab, put your fingers out, grab the gun, because yeah. that's how you do it, and then just twist the gun, and then they can't shoot that, and then I would have just done what I needed to do for him, yeah. and that was my plan, but as his hand come up, he shot me there. I got you in the leg? In the oh, leg, yeah, yeah. that's where the bullet went, right? Because right. mm, you can see it comes through the other side. Yeah, 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 so the bullet went then, the bullet went through there, and out there. <laughs> So that put me straight onto the floor, and I'll give you the I'll give you the X-rays of that, yeah. So that put me straight <laughs> that put me straight on the floor. So then I'm on the floor, huh? yeah. I'm laying on the floor, and I went to him. I'm looking him right in the eyes. I said, "Go on then. You've got to kill me now. Instantly, you've got to kill me." And then he walked up and went bang. And he went down my cock and shot. Me. But all I see at that stage was my the thing move. I never see blood. I will just see that happen, and I never thought nothing. And then I went to get up, and then he shot me through the arm. It went through the through the arm, off the floor, through the spine. I mean, through the pelvis, mm. and then came out. Look, came out of my spine here. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And then basically, and then I've gone back. At that stage, I've said to myself, "Don't say another word." <laughs> so I basically, I've got up. As I've looked up, I've just seen him go like that, and I've actually looked down the barrel of the gun, and I've just seen the bullet come down. It's hit me. And then it just felt like, it, it felt like a punch. It felt like a punch. And my head's gone back, hit the floor, and I thought, wow. And I could hear things. So I thought, well, I'm not even dead. So I've got up, yeah? And then that's when I see the actual bullet coming down, and it actually hit the eye. And it was just like, in the eye. And then I blind, I thought, I'm dead. And then I heard, Marvin, is that you? And I thought, wow, is there people here? And I looked up, and it was a kid from the gym. I was like, and then I just said to him, get my, keep, get my phone out of the car, get my phone out of the car. So he's run over and got my phone out of the car and I rang my mate, told him what happened. Mm. And then they moved me to go to hospital. And then I went to hospital and I was sitting in the, in the corridor <clears throat> and I just said to the, the surgeon, all I said to him, make sure you keep this leg. I don't care how much it costs, keep this leg. And then I went in, went under, woke up. And when I woke up, I just wiggled my toes. Once I wiggled my toes, I just knew I'm gonna walk again. And that was it. <laughs>